On November 12, uh, 1991, uh, in East Timor, which was a, a small nation at that time occupied by the armed forces of Indonesia, um, they had a church service. And after the service, um, a group of people came out and started to walk across town, across the town of Dili, to the cemetery. Uh, they were commemorating the death of a young man named uh, Sebastião Gomez, who had been killed by the army uh, 10 days before, by the Indonesian occupation army. Um, and just the act of walking to the cemetery was dangerous. Uh, they knew that. Uh, and as they started to walk, there were a couple of thousand people. And as they came out of the church onto the, the seaside, people reached inside their clothing and pulled out banners, even more dangerous. They unfurled the banners, they started to walk, and you could see all along the road there were Indonesian military and police lined up, holding their US M16 rifles, holding sticks. It was a, a gauntlet. But these Timorese people had decided to run it. And as they made their way toward the cemetery, and this is through a small, it was the capital city of it is the capital city of Timor, but it's uh, in some ways a small town. There are, at least at that time, there were Buffalo downtown, there were, uh, there were rice paddies. People came out from their homes, uh, from other buildings, and they joined. And as the crowd got larger, you know, 1,000, 2,000, more joining along the way. You started to get the idea that something unusual was, uh, was happening, that this might be the beginning of, of something. It had a pre-insurrectionary feel. I started to think, my God, what is the Indonesian military going to do about this? Because since 1975, they had run East Timor. They had controlled it. But at this moment, it really started to feel like it all could slip away. That was what was in the air. And as it turned out, it was the beginning of something. Because those people uh, chose to come out because they chose to show the banners rather than hiding them, rather than keeping them inside their clothing, because they chose to keep on going even when they saw the guns, even when they saw the soldiers in the helmets, they ended up liberating their nation, ending the occupation, which was in proportional, which had involved in proportional terms uh, the most intensive slaughter since the Nazis, a third of the population murdered. They also indirectly ended up bringing down Suharto, one of the most uh, bloodthirsty dictators of the 20th century. They ended up changing control of the fourth largest country in the world. But they didn't do it alone. They showed amazing courage, will, but unfortunately in life, in history, there's very little correlation between effort and result in so many things, especially in politics. You know, there's that chant that maybe everybody in this room has uh, chanted at one time or another, the people united will never be defeated. 
Well, unfortunately, it's not true. The people united are defeated all the time. And there are mass graves in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in Colombia, in Burma, in the Philippines, in West Papua, in Aceh, in just about every place on earth uh, you'd care to name, where you find people who were, in fact, united and who were also defeated. But that's only one side of the paradox. The other side is that sometimes, if the moment in history is right, sometimes, if you go and pound on the palace door, the entire edifice will collapse. And you never know. You never know whether you are walking to your death, a politically futile death, and your descendants and your community's descendants will be enslaved just like you were. Or, on the other hand, you don't know if you are walking toward the night before victory, the night before the liberation, one of those moments in history when the rules temporarily get suspended and people, if they act fast enough, have a chance to rewrite them, have a chance to rewrite them if they have enough will and and smarts rewrite them in a better way. You never know which one it is. And as it turned out, on that morning, it was a bit before 8 o'clock when it started, as everyone was walking toward the cemetery, things did not start out well. Because although it culminated years later in ecstatic crowds in those same streets celebrating the independence of East Timor. And years after that, ecstatic crowds in the streets of Jakarta celebrating the fall of the dictator Suharto. Although it culminated in that, at that moment, what happened was that the soldiers, as soon as the people arrived at, at the cemetery, the soldiers marched on the crowd. This was the TNI Polri, the Indonesian Armed Forces and Police, the client of the U.S. military, of the U.S. State Department, of the CIA, a decades-long project of Washington. Just the other day, Mitt Romney, or when was it? Uh, what, what debate was that? One of the Republican debates? Foreign policy debate. at, at the foreign policy debate. Mitt Romney uh, was asked about Pakistan. And he said, essentially, well, we should do for Pakistan what we did for Indonesia in the 1960s. <laughs> and what he was referring to was the massacre which brought Suharto and the Indonesian armed forces to control of Indonesia, uh, the ousting of uh, uh, the far less repressive, the, uh, the nationalist the, uh, government of uh, Sukarno, and the installation of Suharto and the consolidation of army rule with a massacre that, uh, according to CIA and other estimates, claimed anywhere from 400,000 to a million uh, Indonesian uh, civilians. That's what the U.S. did for Indonesia in the 60s and that Romney wants to do for Pakistan uh, now. And from then on, actually from even before then, because the U.S. had been trying to use the army to overthrow Sukarno prior to that, that army became a bre uh, an arm of the White House. And so on that morning, there was that arm of the White House, one of many. You know, it's like one of those, uh, uh, those mythical beasts with many, with many tentacles, with many arms. That arm of the White House was poised over the people outside uh, the cemetery at Santa Cruz. And the soldiers came marching down the road. I was there with, uh, with, with Amy Goodman. We were in, kind of in the middle of the crowd at that moment. There were probably about four, 5,000 people in front of the cemetery. Uh, and there, the, the, the place was physically built such that you couldn't really 
unless you were at the back of the crowd, you couldn't really escape. There was nowhere to go. And looking off in the distance, you could see, here come the soldiers. So at that moment, I thought, well, you know, if we just go and stand out front, they'll see that foreigners are there. Um, and uh, hopefully that can prevent them from attacking. So we went and stood in the front of the crowd, about you know, 10, 20 feet in front, facing the soldiers. And they came marching up. And obviously, I was wrong. They had their orders. They closed on the crowd. They got closer and closer. And as they got within feet of us, in unison, they raised their American M16s to their shoulders. And they opened fire on the crowd. Um, the one uh, advantage that our being foreign had was that they didn't shoot us in the chest as they were shooting the Timorese directly behind us. Instead, they grabbed us and, and beat us. But they kept on firing systematically into that crowd. Um, those bullets, those guns, were in essence paid for with U.S. taxpayer dollars. They were sent there by the indirect choice, political choice, of Americans. Because the U.S., as we know, is a political democracy. And the rulers are not imposed, but in some indirect sense, chosen from below. So there was the American public, the body politic of the United States, on that road in Dili, just tearing apart these, these Timorese, whose only crime was to protest, to ask for the end of the slaughter that had killed a third of their people, to ask for independence. Now, in one way, there wasn't anything that unusual about that massacre. They killed on the order of, well, nobody knows exactly, but uh, maybe 200, 300 people. Afterward, they went into the hospitals and dragged people from their hospital beds and executed them. The road outside the cemetery was, was running with blood. It was business in, as usual in occupied Timor because there had been dozens of massacres like that in the years before. But in this case, there was a difference. And that was somebody lived to tell about it and was able to reach the outside world. We were able to report that this massacre had happened. Back here in the US, people like John and Charlie Shiner and Max Serginata and others heard. And people in this country, a few people, just a handful, decided to try to put a stop to this. E10 was formed, uh, how long after was it? Was it about two weeks after? Yeah, that first meeting. Right? Yeah. yeah. It, it was at a church down in the, uh, the village. At first we had about... Uh, what, about 10 people, 15 people? If, if that. First day, yeah. Uh, a smaller, smaller group than this. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, first demonstration was, according to an, an account at the time, was 17 people. Mm. Uh, and the idea was to try to stop this, to try to stop the occupation, the slaughter uh, of East Timor. And we succeeded by pressuring, lobbying, working through the U.S. Congress, we ended up gradually cutting off the U.S. military aid to Indonesia. This happened completely below the radar of the U.S. corporate press. 
Well, there was some coverage of the massacre itself. If you go back and look, you can find a few things. There was never any coverage that I was aware of in any of the big papers or, uh, or networks of the lobbying campaign. Mm -hmm. The lobbying campaign that ended up changing U.S. support for the Indonesian military and in the end triggering the, the downfall of the, uh, of the occupation and ultimately Suharto. There are various reasons, I think, why this was possible. One was that Timor happened to be low on the list of priorities of U.S. foreign policy. It wasn't an issue like Israel-Palestine, uh, like Iraq-Afghanistan, which is near the top. It was, it was one of the dozens of cases where the U.S. is backing terror overseas and where essentially no one knows about it, where the only ones who know what's going on are the people who live in the country and whatever relatives they may have uh, overseas. And later in the discussion period, we go into some of the, the details of, of how this all was, uh, uh, was done. But by mobilizing a few thousand Americans, maybe at the peak, I don't know, 10,000 people, something like that, um, through meetings, demonstrations, but I think most importantly through information lobbying in Congress, slowly we managed to chip away at U.S. support for the Indonesian military, first winning a cutoff of what was called IMET a military training program, the initial cut of about $250,000, then cutting off uh, U.S. supply of uh, spare parts for the Indonesian uh, military helicopters that they use to strafe people from, uh, from overhead, um, then moving on up to other military supplies, tanks, blocking uh, a sale of uh, F-16 fighter planes, and it reached the point where the Indonesian military, uh, well, before that, at no point did this endanger the survival of the Indonesian regime in any material sense. They could have gone and got, bought those weapons elsewhere. And in fact, they did. As soon as, for example, as soon as we succeeded in cutting off the sale of M16s, they went and bought those, uh, similar rifles from Australia. As soon as we succeeded in cutting off the training for Kapasis, the Army uh, Red Berets of Indonesia, uh, the, the most notorious uh, torturers, they went and got similar training from, uh, in that case, from Australia. Uh, it's very similar to what happened in the case of uh, South Africa when uh, U.S. public pressure uh, forced a cutoff of direct U.S. military aid to South Africa. They just got it, th they just got it from Israel. Uh, they got it from uh, Germany. They got it from other places. But what these cutoffs were doing was sending the message to Suharto that their U.S. lifeline was in danger. Because what they got from Washington was not just hardware, it was basically a guarantee, an ultimate guarantee of survival. This, this idea that was in the head of the dictator and his army, that if push came to shove, if their survival was in danger, Washington would step in and save them. But as this small grassroots movement here was chipping away at their military supplies, at their military training from Washington, that presumption got undermined. They got more and more worried. They didn't understand what was going on. They began to doubt that Washington might actually step in to save them. And then in 1997, 
there was what was then called the Asian financial crisis. It started with the failure of a few banks in Thailand. Those countries that were at that time integrated uh, into the, uh, the global financial system, uh, which included Indonesia, which included uh, South Korea, started to uh, started to have financial collapses similar to what we saw in 2008. And in Indonesia, the currency collapsed. Protesters took to the streets, starting in late 1997. And it was a crucial moment for the Suharto regime, because they had never seen a challenge like this before. They had come to power with US backing by murdering half a million to a million people. They had held that power over the years by strategically, carefully uh, chosen, uh, doing a massacre here, an assassination uh, there, putting in a complex series of, uh, of laws that, uh, um, that isolated from society anyone who was involved in uh, resistance to the regime. And here, for the first time, they had a challenge starting with students in Jakarta who came into the streets protesting about the economic collapse, similar to protests here around the economic collapse. And what did they do? Years later, I asked uh, General Sudomo, who was Su uh, Admiral Sudomo, who was Suharto's uh, security chief, why did Suharto fall? And he said, Suharto fell because when the demonstration started, we didn't open fire on the students. So I asked him, why didn't you open fire on the students? And he said, because we were afraid it would be another dilly. They were afraid that they would pay a price like they had after the dilly massacre in Timor. The price that the Timorese and grassroots activism here had inflicted on them of cutback after cutback after cutback in their U.S. military assistance. And Sudomo said they were afraid that if they opened fire on the students in the streets of Jakarta in 97, that would be the end of their U.S. Uh, backing, and that would endanger them even more than the demonstrations themselves. So they held their fire, I think to the surprise of the demonstrators, and more people came out. The demonstration started to grow. You know, people adjust. People become accustomed to things. You can become accustomed to just about anything. People become accustomed to having just one meal a day, to having to drop out of school by the third grade because your family can't afford it, to not being able to get treatment if you have uh, an infection. You know, people say that's life. You can adjust. But people also become accustomed to positive things. And in that moment, as people were coming out and demonstrating and calling for the downfall of the regime of Suharto, they became accustomed to it. Week after week, they were able to come out without the expected uh, army repression. But then one day, outside the Trisakti University in, uh, in West Jakarta, an elite uh, university. A few soldiers did open fire. Several students were killed. And what people had been accustomed to, the new right, de facto right to demonstrate, was taken away. The place exploded in outrage. Here, a country that had been used to years of massacres had suddenly shifted its expectations. And when the higher privilege that they had just won of being able to demonstrate, when that was taken away from them, when these few people were killed, they exploded in outrage. And within weeks, the Suharto regime was swept away. Now, as it happened, similar to what's going on in Egypt now. It was only a partial victory. 
because although Suharto, like Mubarak, was ousted, the army remained. And to this day, the army dominates in Indonesia. But it was a huge world historic victory for the people of, uh, of Indonesia. And I think it's fair to say that it began that morning on the road outside uh, the cemetery in Dili. And it wouldn't have happened. You know, we always talk about how heroic people resisting can be, and that's, that's very true. But some things work and some things don't. And this resistance of the people in Timor wouldn't have worked unless people here had gotten involved and moved to cut the lifeline that ran from the White House to Suharto. You know, as Americans, we live in a very peculiar place. We occupy a very unusual position in the world. You know, now the Occupy Wall Street movement has captured the imagination of the country, even the world, with the, the concept of we are the 99%. But if you're talking about Americans, on a world scale, we are the 1%. We're the one percent. We're the we're the top, with some other rich countries at the, at, the, at the top of the pyramid of wealth. And we're also at the trigger end of of the gun. People like the Timorese are at the exit end where the bullet comes out. We're at the end where the decision is made as to whether the the trigger gets pulled. And that gives people who are American citizens or who happen to be living in the United States a unique power. If people in Tunisia or Egypt or Syria or East Timor or West Papua or Burma or anywhere really almost anywhere else on earth, if they stand up and change the behavior of a government that kills people illegitimately or bring that government down, they will change their society. But if Americans were ever to do that, we would change the world. Because the damage that is done by the decisions that are made in Washington, the decisions on trigger pulling that are made in the White House, the consequence of that is not felt here. It's felt overseas. And we're the only ones, really, in position to stop it. The Timorese could not have come over to, to Washington and cut off the military training aid. Only Americans could have done that. And that situation remains today. When the uprising started in Tunisia and then Egypt, I was, I, I happened to be uh, near the border of uh, Burma and then later in, uh, in Indonesia in Aceh. And I talked to people there about what was happening with these uprisings. And the reaction was very interesting. They basically were not too impressed by what was going on in the Middle East because the death tolls seemed to be so low. Uh, they were seeing the r reports that, you know, in Tunisia and Egypt, you know, people were being killed by the, the hundreds, uh, a couple thousand. They had been, become accustomed to facing uh, a repression where death came, you know, by the, by the multiple thousands. And the, the reaction of, of some people was, like, for example, 
uh, uh, some of the, the monks who were trying to bring down the regime in Burma, was that, well, that's a great thing, but it's not very relevant to our example, because we are, we are facing such a, an intractable, unbeatable force in this Burmese regime. But in fact, a few months later, that analysis of theirs proved to be incorrect. Because although the people on the ground didn't really see the Arab uprisings as a precedent for them, apparently the rulers of Burma did. When they looked at what was happening in Tunisia and Egypt, they saw the room rulers being run out of power, they started to think, my God, this could happen to us. They knew that led by monks, people had been organizing for, for at least four years. They knew that their program of uh, jailing opposition people, giving them 90-year sentences, torturing them in the prisons, might not be enough. And they got this idea that they could be next. And to the shock of the movement, the regime started making unilateral concessions. They started to retreat. They started releasing a few political prisoners. They started allowing a few uh, demonstrations. Nobody knows where it, will, uh, where it will go now, but it looks like the beginning of the end of that regime. Here in the U.S., You know, watching from overseas as the Occupy Wall Street movement started. It was, it was striking to see because, you know, for years, people had been coming out to demonstrate here. People had been protesting on every issue you could imagine. And in many ways, not that much had been accomplished. There had been defeat after defeat after defeat. And we had all developed an analysis of the, the U.S. system, the U.S. power system, which often made it seem like it was unbeatable. No matter what you did, the press would ignore it. No matter what you did, any blow that you tried to deliver to the system uh, would be absorbed. But then suddenly, there seemed to be a sense that something was starting here. And this demonstration, relatively small in comparison to, uh, to others, was front page news initially ignored, initially hostile in the coverage, but it became, it became massive. I think it's the beginning of a, uh, of a moment in, uh, in history where the rules can be suspended. 30 years the U.S. has been frozen, in a sense, politically. Only the rich have been able to organize suspensions of the rules. They did that in late 2008 with the financial crisis. Paulson at the Treasury wrote a memo of a few pages saying, I want the authority to, to go and disperse trillions to save the banks completely outside normal procedures. But because the U.S. was threatened with financial collapse, he got the authority by consensus from the President and from Congress. No one had ever been able to do that before. But now, with this movement getting the attention of uh, 
of the corporate press, of the same press that for years had ignored previous movements, unable to resist the, uh, the spectacle of it. I think we're in a moment where it's possible to rewrite some rules. The Occupy Wall Street movement has gotten, you know, it's been endorsed by some unsavory uh, people. All these democratic politicians uh, coming forward, various rich people uh, expressing sympathy. That's a sign of success, but it's also a sign that you're not ambitious enough in your demands. Not ambitious enough in the challenge. But it's an opening. It's a, uh, uh, it's a beginning. And it's very exciting. You know, in Indonesia, Suharto was overthrown, but the army continued. The people who commanded the massacre in Timor were then transferred to Aceh at the other end of the archipelago. And they commanded similar massacres there. But because of what the Timorese accomplished, and because of what people here accomplished by making the Indonesian regime pay a price, those subsequent massacres in Aceh and more recently in, in Papua were on a smaller scale than those in Timor. The army felt a certain constraint. They had been forced to pay a price. They had to hold their fire to some extent. There's no doubt that the, Simmer, the Timorese saved tens of, tens of thousands of lives in Aceh, tens of thousands of lives in, in Papua. And that same kind of constraint, in a sense, operates now in the United States. The United States, like the Suharto regime, was founded on massacre, massacre of the native population. It began as a police state with slavery in place. But it also began with a system that had open elements to it. Part of the genius of the American founders was that they recognized that there was a lot more to politics than force. That if you have a goal of, as James Madison put it in a, you know, in a famous quote, making sure that control of the government stayed in the hands of the opulent, the rich, if you had a goal like, you know, as John Jay said, uh, that the people who own the country should govern it, you didn't have to enforce that at the barrel of a gun. That was not necessary. There were other ways to do it, more subtle, more effective, more enduring ways. You could write the rules in a certain way and then say, okay, open competition, political choice, free speech, elections. And that's the way the U.S. and other successor open systems around the world have evolved. And it's now to the point where direct force in American politics is fairly minimal, especially compared to other countries. Slavery as an institution is gone. The massacres of labor demonstrators are, are over. The political assassinations that were happening as recently as the 1970s against, at that time, for example, various members of the Black Liberation Movement, those are over. Can't do those anymore. Even the massive FBI surveillance and uh, uh, disruption programs that they did in the 70s into the uh, early 80 programs against various uh, movements, uh, those are over. Uh, 
They're over because, well, for two basic reasons. One, because people resisted them, demanded the end. Popular organizing won victories. And secondly, because the system was able to accommodate to a new reality in which, even without massacres of labor demonstrators, even without assassinations of political leaders, the rich were still rich. The powerful were still powerful. In fact, under the complex American rules of open political competition, since the 70s, they've gotten even richer. They are just as unconstrained in their exercise of the right to kill overseas as they've ever been. Obama today can order a drone, a drone strike anywhere on any one. He can order troops into any country at any time. But he can't do it here. He can't do it within the United States. So we have this situation where the United States is, in some senses, as much of a threat to the rest of the world as it ever was, but where the rules that prevail within the United States are more open than they've ever been. Now, recently they've been rewritten to some extent because of the, uh, the law on, on, on terror, the U.S., the, the, the war on terror, as they call it. The U.S. is uh, de facto trying to apply different laws to Muslims than uh, to, to everyone uh, else. But still, the basic framework of speech and civil liberties remains. And people in the U.S. have the opportunity to take to the streets without facing massacre, without facing assassination. It's almost the mirror opposite of the situation that prevails in the, 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 state, the various client states that the U.S. Uh, sponsors. You know, when Occupy Wall Street started, it seemed that the, uh, the city was a bit caught off guard. You know, Bloomberg didn't know quite what to do. The other mayors uh, didn't know quite what to do. They were back on their heels. Eventually, they got themselves together. Uh, you know, they called in the, uh, the robocops with the, uh, the tear gas and the, and the pepper spray, and they evicted people, and they beat them back. But they can't send in troops and open fire. They can't do what was done that morning on the road outside the, uh, the Santa Cruz Cemetery. If 500,000 people suddenly showed up in Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C., and decided to scale the White House fence, they wouldn't be able to stop them. If people found which you can because it's on the public record, the sites from which the, the drone attacks uh, are launched and surrounded them and sat in on the, uh, the roads where the supplies uh, come in and besieged them and try to shut them down. If you had a large enough crowd, they would be able to respond with tear gas, but they wouldn't be able to respond with bullets like they did on the the road outside of Santa Cruz. This is politically not possible in today's United States. The system as it functions today counts on the fact that they can win the game. And usually they do win the game. Because in any kind of open system, as long as you start with an unequal distribution of wealth, you're usually going to end with an unequal distribution of, of uh, winners in, uh, in the game. It's a pretty simple uh, thing. But the flaw in that model, I mean, it's a brilliant model, it's a very stable model, but the flaw in it from the point of view of the rulers is that if people realize that, if people 
in an act of collective will, recognize how much opportunity they have, how much power they have, how much they can get away with before they are killed, how much they can get away with as they are thrown in jail and tortured, as, happened, as happens to basically everyone else in the world who tries to really stand up uh, to power. If people realize that, and as a group move against the powers, then that formula no longer works. Because there is so much, and not only that, but the press will cover it. The press will cover it. You know, this is actually not, well, Occupy Wall Street is actually not the first time that the corporate press has ended up giving a gigantic megaphone to a movement that uh, is not exactly their ideological cup of tea. Uh, remember the, uh, the Million Men March of, uh, of Farrakhan back in uh, 95. You could not have imagined a political movement more repugnant uh, to the, uh, the, the ideological perspective of the corporate press. But there it was, uh, with perhaps a million people gathered on, on the mall uh, in, in Washington, on live TV, on every, single, uh, on every single network, because they could not resist the spectacle. And since then, the media system has become much more diverse. There are far more channels. There are far more means of uh, communication. Um, I think the impact, the media impact that Occupy Wall Street had gives an indication of what is possible, but only the beginnings of an indication. If you had a movement that was not just sitting in at parks, but actually besieging places that are key uh, centers of power, you think the media is going to black that out? Uh, they can't. It would be 24 hours. It would be uh, uh, the nerve endings of the body politic would be quivering uh, uh, nonstop. And politically, the system would be fundamentally constrained because it's not like the turn of the century and the Ludlow Massacre. Uh, it's not like the 1970s and the ability to uh, assassinate uh, Black Panthers. It's a different world we're living in. Uh, and the potential of popular power now in the US is vast. It's vast. And often in politics, one of the biggest problems is that on the occasion, on the, there are occasions when you have power and you don't even realize how much you have. An unrelated, uh, uh, an example that's often an angle, but it's interesting. On January 1st, 1994, uh, the Zapatistas rose up in Chiapas, uh, southern Mexico. The, <coughs> it was a media sensation. In military terms, it wasn't much of an uprising. They had very few weapons. There was very little uh, fighting. But when you arrived in, uh, in the town square where they were, uh, you could barely see the sun for all the, uh, uh, the, the satellite uh, TV, TV disks. It, was, uh, it, had, it had captured uh, the attention uh, and the eyes, not just of Mexico, but of the world. And at that time, um, and this was, they had timed their uprising for the date of implementation of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which was, in a sense, the first big step in the uh, corporatization of the world economy. This was an agreement among Canada, uh, the U.S., and Mexico, which allowed, <coughs> essentially, for the free flow of corporate capital across borders with rules written in a way that were of maximum advantage uh, to the corporations and uh, devastating for people like the small uh, corn farmers of, of, of Mexico, for, uh, <coughs> as one example. And so they chose this day as the day of their uprising and protest, and they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams in terms of getting attention and, and political impact. And at that time, down there, I asked uh, Marcos, uh, who, who was one of the, the leaders of the Zapatistas, he was actually an academic 
uh, a professor, I think, of, what was it? Uh, uh, what do they teach? Semantics or something like that. Uh, uh, who, who would go on into, and go on into the forests and uh, uh, become an organizer very successfully. And asked him if they had thought of staging the uprising a few months earlier when the NAFTA bill was actually before the U.S. Congress. Because the NAFTA legislation passed by a, a, a razor-thin margin. It was hotly contested in the House. The vote could have gone either way. And there's no question that if the Zapatistas had risen just a few months before, that would have killed the bill. Uh, uh, it, it would have swung a couple of, of, of votes in, in the House, and there would have been no NAFTA. So rather than protesting the implementation of NAFTA, the Zapatistas could have prevented the implementation of NAFTA, but they didn't know it. Uh, uh, as Marco said, it never occurred to them to think that they could have, that, that they, they could dream of having such uh, clouts as influence on a fundamental policy decision uh, up in Washington. But as it turns out, that power was there waiting for them. They just didn't know it yet. And I think it's conceivable that we may be at a moment like that here in the United States. Just as, as the crowd came out of the church uh, at Santa Cruz and started walking toward the cemetery, uh, the, those Timorese were on the verge of overthrowing Suharto of overthrowing the Indonesian military, of ending a Nazi-like terror uh, in a way that no grassroots movement was ever able to do against the Nazis themselves. Just as they had no reason, at that moment, the Timorese had no reason to think that they were doing anything but walking to their deaths, and that's what it was for about 300 of them. You know, they didn't know what could come of that. We may be on the verge of a moment like that uh, here in the States. And the, the terrain that's open before us as, as Americans, as people here, it's just vast. I mean, my God, you compare what you're up against here. You're up against pepper spray. You're up against tear gas. You're up against guys with truncheons who beat you and who fire tear gas canisters that may fracture your skull and uh, jail sentences and, and things like that compared to what people are up against at the other end of the gun. The exit end, where those US supplied bullets for the M16 come out, you're not up against much. It may sound harsh to say that, but it's true. And it makes a fundamental difference. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was over in, uh, in West Papua, an area of Indonesia that's under kind of de facto occupation by the Indonesian Armed Forces. This is one of the richest places in the world. It's where much of the world's gold uh, comes from. There are vast reserves of uh, timber that is, uh, uh, th that's stripped. They're now uh, the, the Indonesian government with uh, participation from companies, some, some of them run by the very same military officers who massacred East Timor. They're talking about building the world, the largest plantation ever in world history. Uh, they're projecting uh, Im importing a workforce of hundreds of thousands of uh, people. I mean, th this is a that was 25 million in one document. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the, they have these insane figures that they're talking about, but they really are talking about uh, cutting down all the trees and building a plantation in an area larger than Massachusetts. Uh, uh, in this place, in, in Papua, the, the local population is trying to uh, resist this. Uh, many are demanding uh, independence. And it's just one example of what they've been doing. They've been holding a series of mass uh, rallies and meetings. And in October, they had a, a congress in Jayapura, the, the capital of Papua, where people came to a soccer field, thousands of people, and they tried to elect among themselves a local uh, leadership uh, that would make their, uh, their case. And when it was all over, uh, the army had, and the police had pulled up in, in their US supplied uh, tanks, and they had killed uh, anywhere from three to six people. The official number is three, people say it was actually six. But 
in the eyes of the, the local people there, in a sense, this showed how much power they had. This showed how much room they had to operate. They had killed six, not 60. They had killed six, not 600. They had tried to crush that movement and they had failed because for various reasons their hand was, the hand of the, the fist of the military was stayed. It was held back by recent history, in part held back by what the Timorese had done, by what people here had done, by making the Indonesian army pay a price. And so they saw that they could go forward and they are going, uh, they are going forward now. Here, if you try to op organize, if you're thinking about organizing a demonstration of a few thousand people, you're not thinking about a possible death toll of, uh, of six. You're thinking about a death toll of zero. You're thinking about a few arrests. You're thinking about uh, some tear gas. And in today's environment, you're thinking about massive uh, press coverage. This is enormous power, enormous potential power, and it's just, you know, it's just there over the, uh, over the horizon. And I think Americans have a responsibility to use it. You know, in a way, these past few decades, it's been possible to talk about the fact that for high U.S. officials, murder is still legal. They can kill anyone they want as long as they do it overseas. It's been possible to talk about the fact that, you know, there are dollars here <coughs> that have shifted would move from buying a, a trinket to buying the food that would save someone's life. It's impossible to talk about some things, but in practical political terms, it wasn't possible to do a whole lot about them politically. But now perhaps it is. We may be on the edge of that kind of moment, and we've got to grab it because no one else can. No one else can step in and grab it. And finally, you know, the bodies were never found from the Timor massacre. To this day, we don't know where they are. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. I mean, where do you put 300 bodies? Uh, well, they found a place, maybe at sea, maybe at various places in, in the countryside. Nobody knows where those bodies are. Um, but the souls, I think, are marching. Those souls, I think, are now marching in West Papua, in Paniai, uh, an area in the central mountains, which just in the past three weeks has been attacked by the Bree mob, paramilitary police, has been attacked by the Indonesian army, strafed from the air by, uh, by helicopters. Uh, I think they're marching on the, on the West Bank. They could even be marching in, in Washington, in New York City. And souls, you know, can't be stopped by bullets. You could fire an M16 at them, it's not going to stop them. They're there as long as we summon them. You know, people have the choice. Power is, lo is mainly psychological. There's a physical element to power, of course. There's a physical element to wealth. But most of it's a psychological choice that's made in the head of a majority of people. It's a choice that you recognize the power, the, the property of the, the rich man. Say, oh, that's his. I can't enter. I can't touch it. It's a choice that you submit to the power of the guy with the gun. I mean, it's an obvious choice that when he's pointing it at your head, yeah, you submit. Anybody would if they're, in, in most cases, it's an obvious rational choice. But 99.9% .9 of the time, that gun is not pointed at your head. The gun is pointed elsewhere. It's in his holster. And for every one gun he and his friends have, there are thousands of people. There are thousands of people. And it's only the thinking and the choices in the minds of those people that holds them back. 
that keeps them from rushing the one guy with the gun and disarming him. Uh, maybe we have the chance to do that here in the United States. Rush the guy with the gun and disarm them. I mean, imagine if all the souls that, that the U.S. had killed, all the civilians in Central America, from Central America, from South America, from Africa, from the Middle East, from Southeast Asia, from South Asia, if they all came in and occupied the White House. Imagine how crowded that would be. Hundreds of thousands, millions, I mean, depending on how, how many years you want to turn it back. You wouldn't be able to fit them all into the White House. They'd fill up the Oval Office. They'd fill up the, uh, the Lincoln bedroom. They'd fill up the old executive office building right next door to the White House where all the real staff work gets done. They'd fill up the mall. They'd fill up the halls of uh, uh, Congress. Those guys wouldn't be able to get any work done. They wouldn't be able to move for all those, uh, uh, those souls who would come back to remind them of what they had uh, done. Well, they don't have flesh. Souls can't do that, but we have flesh. And we also have enough people to do that exact same thing. There are enough Americans, there are enough people in the United States who think it's wrong to kill civilians, who think it's wrong uh, to withhold uh, money that could save someone who's uh, uh, dying from hunger or whose, or whose body is being turned into a skeleton by, uh, by TB and diarrhea and, uh, and malnutrition. There are enough people like that with a little uh, common decency who, if they converged all at once, could occupy every space on the White House uh, lawn and inside the White House and uh, in many other key strategic uh, places where real decisions get done. Now, usually it's fantasy to, to imagine such things, but at certain moments of history, everything speeds up. Thirty years' worth of history can happen in an afternoon, and I think we may be approaching uh, one of those moments, um, but only if we choose to, to make it so, like the Timorese did in Dili. So. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you.